Confession of Faith, Chapter 7 Of God's Covenant with Man, Section 2 The first covenant made with man was a covenant of works, wherein life was promised to Adam, and in him to his posterity, upon condition of perfect and personal obedience. Question 1. Was the first covenant God made with man a covenant of works? Answer, yes. In that first covenant God said, in effect, Do this and live. Genesis 2, verse 17. Genesis 2, verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Thus making it a covenant of works. Galatians 3, verse 12. Galatians 3, verse 12. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. That it was a proper covenant is implied in the following considerations. Number 1. From Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17. Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. In which were parties, a condition, a penalty, and a promise implied. Number 2. From Hosea 6, verse 7. Hosea 6, verse 7. But they, like men, have transgressed the covenant. There have they dealt treacherously against me. Like man, in the Hebrew, like Adam, have transgressed the covenant. Also, compare Job 31, verse 33, with Genesis 3, verse 12. Job 31, verse 33. If I covered my transgressions as Adam, by hiding mine iniquity in my bosom. Genesis 3, verse 12. And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Number 3. From the various references to script in Scripture to the covenant under which man naturally remains as descended from Adam. Romans 5, verses 12 and 14. Romans 10, verse 5. Galatians 4, verse 24. And Galatians 5, verse 4. Romans 5, verses 12 and 14. Verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Romans 10, verse 5. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Galatians 4, verse 24, which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. Galatians 5, verse 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Number 4. From the comparison of Adam's representation of mankind under Christ's representation of his people, which latter representation is under a covenant. Number five, from the fact that Adam and his posterity fell under the penalty threatened. Romans 5, verse 12. Romans 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Question 2. Was there a promise of life made in that covenant of works, and wherein did it consist? Answer. Yes. In the covenant of works, the Orthodox confess that Adam, and through him his posterity, was promised not only the life in paradise, but the eternal and heavenly life. This question was first moved by those who sought to establish the natural morality of man, and prove that death is not the consequence of sin. The reasons for the affirmation are as follows. Number 1. The law of works had the promise of heavenly and eternal life, therefore also the law prescribed to Adam. In each instance, it is the same law as to substance. The former is evident from these scriptures, Leviticus 18, verse 5, Matthew 19, verses 16 and 17, and Romans 7, verse 10. Leviticus 18, verse 5. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. 
Matthew 19, verses 16 and 17. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Romans 7, verse 10. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. These promises have not reference to earthly life, but to heavenly. Since, however, after the fall, the law can justify no one, Romans 3, verse 28. Romans 3, verse 28. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. This promise must necessarily have had place in upright Adam. Number two, it is confirmed by this. Christ acquired the eternal and celestial life which he bestows upon us in no other way than that, being made under the law, he fulfilled the righteousness of the law for us. Romans 8 verse 4 and Galatians 4 verse 5. Romans 8 verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Galatians 4 verse 5, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Number three, the threatened death embraces both temporal and eternal death to be suffered in hell, for that death is understood, the empire of which the devil obtained on account of sin. Hebrews 2 verse 14. Hebrews 2 verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Number four. The promises of the new covenant are said to be better than those of the old. Hebrews 8, verse 6. Hebrews 8, verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Not as to substance, but as to mode. Question 3. Was this covenant made with Adam, made also with his posterity in him? Answer. Yes. It appears in that, number 1, the expression of the covenant. Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17. Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Is an address to the man alone and in the singular. Number two, in the history. The covenant is represented as made when man was introduced in the, ar in the garden, excuse me, and Eve is represented as created afterwards in Genesis 2, verses 15 through 21. Genesis 2, verses 15 through 21. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meat for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found and help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. Number 3. The scriptures compare Christ and Adam as representing heads. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 22 and 47. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 22 and 47. Verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And verse 47. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is of the Lord, from heaven. Number four. The scriptures represent the breach of the covenant as one offense and the offense of one man. Romans 5, verses 12 through 20. Romans 5, verses 12 through 20. Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin? And so death passed upon all men, that all have sinned.
For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one the condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more then, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Question 4. What was the condition of this covenant of works? Answer. The condition of this covenant of works was made upon condition of perfect and personal obedience. Genesis 2 verse 17 and Genesis 3 verse 10. Or excuse me, in Galatians, Galatians 3 verse 10. Genesis 2, verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Galatians 3, verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. First, Adam doubtlessly had the most perfect law. The most perfect law is the law of love, however, and that is the law of the Ten Commandments. Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39. Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Adam, therefore, was in possession of the law of the Ten Commandments. Secondly, all agree that the law which is embedded in the nature of the heathen and is a remnant of that law which Adam had embedded in his nature is identical to the law of the Ten Commandments. Thus, Adam's law is the law of the Ten Commandments. Thirdly, this is confirmed in Romans 8, verse 3. Romans 8, verse 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh... God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Paul speaks there of a law, referring to it as the law, without any further description. Without a doubt, the law is the law of the Ten Commandments. This law Adam possessed in full strength, which after the fall had become weak, as has been demonstrated. Adam was thus in possession of the law of the Ten Commandments. Fourthly, there is but one holiness, for holiness is the image of God, which is singular in nature. The law is thus also singular in nature, for man's perfect conformity to the law of the Ten Commandments is holiness. Therefore, as far as content was concerned, Adam, in his perfection, had the Ten Commandments as his law. In addition to the law of nature, God gave Adam a command which, in his sovereignty, he could or could not have given the command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is called a positive law, because it did not bind man from the nature of the thing, which was in itself indifferent, but from the mere will of God. This may readily suggest the question, why did God give this commandment to Adam? Had God not given this commandment to him, he would not have sinned. My response is, number one, that it does not necessarily follow that he then would not have sinned. Adam was holy, but mutable, and thus he could also have sinned in a different situation. Number two, God does not always give an account of his deeds. If anyone wishes to meditate somewhat upon this commandment, it will become evident that much is comprehended in this commandment. It declared that God alone was the Lord, and thus entitled to command Adam as he pleased, and that Adam was thus required to obey blindly, without asking why. Thirdly, 
In it was also comprehended that man should desire nothing else but the will of God, and that everything should be defined as desirable or undesirable in relationship to God only. Number four. This commandment comprehends man's felicity consisting in the enjoyment of God himself, an enjoyment not to be found in anything outside of him. Therefore, Adam had no need of what would seem to be most desirable, but could do without it. Number five. It also implies that man was to be satisfied with the present degree of perfection which God was pleased to confer at that moment. The question, why did God give such a commandment, cannot be answered by man other than by saying, it was God's sovereign good pleasure. We have thus observed that Adam had a law.